Welcome to this Baha for worship service. We gather from Borderlands Unitarian Universalist in Amato, from Sky Island Unitarian Universalist Church in Sierra Vista, from Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation on the northwest side of Tucson, and from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson on the east side. We gather as four congregations because we believe we are stronger together. Today is the end of one series that we've been doing on the topic of neighbors, neighboring. In this series, we've heard from neighbors across Unitarian Universalism. We have explored how we can relate to our neighbors in this complicated time. We have imagined a neighborhood that does not yet exist, but we long and hope for. And today we are ending our neighbor series and hearing from one more person who is new to our so-called neighborhood. The Reverend Carlton E. Smith was recently named the lead for the Pacific Western region of our Unitarian Universalist Association. Reverend Carlton has been the candidate for U.S. Congress in 2018 and for state Senate in 2019 in his native state of Mississippi. He serves on the campaign board for the LGBTQ Victory Fund, and on the Board of Trustees for the Living Legacy Project. He was also among the clergy counter-protesters at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. But first, let us start by acknowledging that we are living on lands that have been long stewarded by the Chiricahua Apache, by the Pasquayaki, by the Otham, and Opata peoples who are the indigenous stewards of this land and our neighbors today. And now hear these words of, worship, of opening, of calling ourselves to worship. These words from Reverend Richard Gilbert. We meet on holy grounds brought into being as life encounters life, as personal histories merge into a communal story. As we take on the pride and the pain of our companions, as our separate selves become community. How desperate is our need for one another? Our silent beckoning to our neighbors, our invitations to share life and death together, our welcome into the lives of those we meet and their welcome into our own. May our souls capture this treasured time. May our spirits celebrate our meeting in this time and in this space, for we meet on holy grounds. As I light this chalice, I invite you to join me 
from whenever and wherever you are listening today and hear these words collected by the Unitarian Universalist Association, but whose author is unknown. Our different paths come together in this holy place, graced by the history of our free religious heritage. Let us be mindful of the forces deep within that call us to become more than we are. May this time bring rest and renewal, comfort and challenge. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but are connected in mystery and wonder to each other, to this community, and to the universe. everyone. I'm Reverend Carlton E. Smith. I am the lead for the Pacific Western region of our Unitarian Universalist Association, and I'm so glad to be with you all today. I'm in my hometown of Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is close to Memphis, Tennessee. 
I understand your theme for these past several weeks has been to neighbor. And part of the inspiration for that theme came from the program, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, which is familiar to some of us who are of a certain generation and perhaps more familiar to those of you who are, are of a younger generation is Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is based on Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. What I wanna share with you today in this For All Ages is a story about a young boy who visited Mr. Rogers at his house during the 1970s. This young man's name was Jeff, and Jeff was someone who was five years old and who was in a wheelchair. He was in a wheelchair because he had a tumor that's a condition that he had in his body that prevented his hands and his legs from working. So starting from the age of four, he needed to be in a wheelchair. So instead of coming into Mr. Rogers' house, Jeff needed to talk to Mr. Rogers outside of the house. So Mr. Rogers came down from his porch and sat on the steps of the porch and talked with Jeff while Jeff was in his wheelchair. And one of the things that they did while they were together is that they sang a song together. And it's a song that I remember from that time and I saw it on a video recently on YouTube and I wanna share it with you today in the spirit that Mr. Rogers and Jeff sang to each other on that day. It's a song that Fred Rogers wrote and it's called, It's You I Like. It's you I like. Not the things you wear, not the way you do your hair, but it's you I like. The way you are right now, the way down deep inside you, not the things that hide you, not your fancy chair that's just beside you, but it's you I like every part of you, your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whatever old or new. I hope that you'll remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like, it's you yourself, it's you, it's you I like. And after singing that song, Mr. Rogers said, it is you that I like, Jeff. And Jeff said back, thanks. Mr. Rogers said to him, and there must be times when you do feel blue. And Jeff said, uh-huh. Mr. Rogers said back, I'm not feeling blue right now though. And Jeff said, me neither. And it's the case that Jeff left Mr. Rogers' neighborhood and he went on to become a full grown man many years later. And when Mr. Rogers was presented with an award for the Television Hall of Fame, Jeff showed up in order to be one of the ones who celebrated that occasion with him. And I hope that you know that for all of us who are part of your Unitarian Universalist community, both those who are local and those who are far away like I am, that we like you just the way you are. Though I may speak with bravest
So as we move out into the neighborhood, as we imagine the conversations we would like to have with our neighbors, whether they are your actual neighbors or people who are in your life, how do we carry our UU values into those conversations? One thing that is so important in having difficult conversations is remembering the difference between feeling comfortable and feeling safe. And it's actually important to not go into conversations where you feel unsafe. It's not every conversation and not every moment is the right time, and that's okay. But the more we can reestablish a sense of safety with ourselves and feel grounded, the greater capacity we have to experience discomfort, which a lot of challenging conversations right now will make us uncomfortable, and that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. So this is an exercise that I invite you to join me in practicing. And it's gonna look really silly for you to watch me doing it because you can see the wall behind me. But essentially this is an exercise of checking, visually checking behind yourself and letting that be a way to remind your brain that your surroundings are okay and that you're physically safe right now. And it's a way of regrounding. So just go ahead and take a breath and cast your gaze over either shoulder and just notice and whatever you see there. Go ahead and just take that in and now we're going to look over the other shoulder. And now, now we know where we are we are reminded that we are in a place that's safe. And from this place of safety, it's okay to reach out, even if it makes us anxious or makes us uncomfortable. When we're grounded in safety, we have a more rooted way of approaching the situation. I offer this reading of chapter 31 from the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu as translated by Stephen Mitchell and respectfully degendered by me. 
Weapons are the tools of violence. All decent people detest them. Weapons are the tools of fear. A decent person will avoid them, except in the direst necessity, and, if compelled, will use them only with the utmost restraint. Peace is a decent person's highest value. If the peace has been shattered, how can they be content? Their enemies are not demons, but human beings like themselves. They don't wish anyone personal harm, nor do they rejoice in victory. How could they rejoice and delight in the slaughter of others? They enter a battle gravely, with sorrow and with great compassion, as if they were attending a funeral. So ends the reading. Good morning. I am so delighted to be with you here today and to represent the love and care of your larger Unitarian Universalist Association, including Reverend Summer El Beati, who is the Pacific Western Region primary UUA contact for Sky Island, Reverend Sarah Gibb Milspa, who is the primary contact for the UU Church of Tucson, Mountain Vista, and Borderlands, UUA Director of Congregational Life, Jessica York, that's who I report to, Executive Director, Car Executive Vice President, Carrie McDonald, President, Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, the over 200 congregations and covenanting communities in the Pacific Western region, and the more than 1,000 Unitarian Universalist congregations and covenanting communities across the country. I'm grateful to my colleagues, Reverend Sam, Reverend Matthew, Reverend Tina, and Reverend Bethany for inviting me to be here with you. I want to begin by honoring this experiment that you as member congregations of the Baha Four have undertaken to collaborate on Sunday worship for the benefit of each congregation, each Unitarian Universalist and each guest involved. I've often heard it said that the way many Unitarian Universalist congregations come into being is by breaking off from other Unitarian Universalist congregations. I don't mention this in judgment of congregations that have been broken away from or of those that have broken away. Not all relationships are sustainable. I do celebrate that in Arizona, we have an example of UU congregations coming together willingly in a time of crisis to create together what no one of them could do alone. Congratulations. When Reverend Sam and I were having our initial conversation about the shape of this service as part of your election season to neighbor series, I remember our talking about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I grew up watching that show as part of that first generation of children to benefit from child-centered programming on public television. Mr. Rogers, Sesame Street, The Electric Company, and Zoom were, and that's before Zoom technology that we're using today, uh, were all meaningful parts of my formative years in the late 60s and early 70s. Each in its own way presented young, people, very young people, adults, animals, and yes, even monsters from diverse backgrounds finding ways to live, play, and work together. Mr. Rogers very intentionally and effectively communicated the concept behind our first Unitarian Universalist principle, that everyone has worth and dignity just as they are. When Won't You Be My Neighbor, the documentary film about Fred Rogers came out two years ago, I saw it twice in theaters and I cried like a baby both times, but especially the first time that I saw it. I had to stifle what would have been very loud wailing. I was so moved to see, to see such compassion and care exemplified on the screen. I might have been less moved if care and compassion weren't so rare in recent years. I am profoundly maladjusted to the disregard for human life, for human rights, equality, and justice that I see throughout our government and in society at large. The attacks on the fundamentals of civility have become so aggressive that when someone does live out universal values of harmony, fairness, and love, it occurs as a surprise. 
This is one of the reasons I appreciate our Unitarian Universalist congregations and communities. Even if we sometimes disappoint each other, even if we still have a ways to go before we are more fully realized as a people with love and justice at the center of our being, we nonetheless have tools, resources, relationships, and experiences that guide us in that direction. I believe the genius of our religious tradition is that it is a grand experiment in human living, one that is often on the cutting edge of affirming people where they are and as who they are, all while encouraging them to be their best selves. As in our association, so it is in my neighborhood here in Holly Springs, Mississippi, near Memphis, Tennessee, where I am with you from today. I, like many of my neighbors here, and perhaps some of you, was relieved by the outcome of the recent presidential election. At the same time, I know that some of my neighbors have come out as ardent supporters of a former candidate for elected office whom I vehemently opposed. Some of these folks I know pretty well and they know my family. I believe some even voted for me when I was running for state Senate last year. On the one hand, I wonder what their story is that would have them support someone whom I see as a real threat to my life, to the lives of people I love, and perhaps to human life in general. On the other hand, I'm not all that interested in their stories and would choose to spend my time helping people at risk of becoming harmed through the violent speech of that former candidate. In the midst of this, in thinking about neighbors and neighborhoods, I started to ask myself, well, what does it mean to be a neighbor anyway? I recognize words as powerful and I enjoy using the online etymological dictionary to trace them back to their roots. So if we take the word neighbor, it comes from an old English word, which means near dweller, in part from the Proto-Germanic word, a Proto-Germanic word, and a Proto-Indo-European word root that means this, to be, to exist, or to grow. And this goes all the way back to a Sanskrit word for becoming. So being a neighbor has something to do with even becoming. So our neighbors and we ourselves are becoming, but exactly what are we becoming? We don't know the answer to that question always. We may never know the answer to that question. I would venture to say that we fear what our neighbors are becoming, perhaps threats to our livelihoods, our peaceful neighborhoods, our families, and perhaps our very lives. However, when we fear what our neighbors are becoming, we foreclose on the possibility that our neighbors are becoming our allies, our champions, our friends, our inspiration, our teachers, our partners, and our family. How about the roots of the word healing and to heal? To heal comes from the old English word to cure, save, or make whole, sound, and well. Healing points us to words that originally meant restoration of health, restoration of wholeness, and perhaps most poetically, the touch that cures. That's what healing is, the touch that cures. That comes to us from the 17th century. I recognize my own need for healing from the hurt that I felt over these past years. I confess to a degree of glee in knowing someone I thought was unfit for office, someone who so intentionally did so much harm to people had been defeated. Seeing that person lose their job has felt like regaining a bit of power after years of feeling powerless to stop the unraveling of things I value about my homeland. I've taken a bit of satisfaction in knowing that that candidate supporters and voters might feel some of the pain my friends, family, and I have felt for a long time now. But then I have to back up off of those feelings. In my heart of hearts, I don't want any one of my neighbors to suffer. I actually want everyone to do well, to have their true needs met, to have the experience of being appreciated and loved. I don't delight in their pain, even though from my angle, it appears self-inflicted. 
I don't gloat at the effective use of the vote to remove someone from their position, though from my angle, it was absolutely necessary. People who don't wear masks, who don't maintain physical distancing, who threaten other people's lives are my enemies as far as preserving human life goes, but I don't want harm to come their way and would be sad at the news of their sickness or demise because of COVID-19 or any other ailment. Now, I want to be clear, I don't affirm and promote coddling people who behave in ways that are racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, ableist, classist, transphobic, narcissistic, or any other way that brings harm to others or themselves. Part of the reason our country and the world are in such dire shape now is that the leash has often been too long on systemic oppressions of all kinds. How long has that leash been? Oh, decades long, generations long, centuries long, millennia long. Some fights just have to be fought, but as Lao Tzu tells us, only as a last resort only when all else has failed. We are all neighbors on this big blue marble in space. We are all becoming something. If we follow the examples of Fred Rogers, Lao Tzu, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Vernon Damer, Grace Lee Boggs, Wangari Mathai, Stacey Abrams, and so, so many others, living and departed, famous and obscure, we are becoming neighbors who are healing together. As the workbook of A Course in Miracles offers us as a meditation, when I am healed, I am not healed alone. When I am healed, we are healed as one. I close out with words from Fred Rogers from his 1999 induction into the Television Critics Hall of Fame. Jeff Erlinger, whom I mentioned in the For All Ages, who had visited Mr. Robert's neighbor, Rogers' neighborhood as a quadriplegic five-year-old in a motorized wheelchair back in the 70s, was on hand as an adult to offer his thanks and appreciation on the occasion. Hear now Fred Rogers' words about the power of television and think how you would apply these words to your congregation and to our Unitarian Universalist tradition. I feel that those of us in television are chosen to be servants. It doesn't matter what our particular job, we are chosen to help meet the deep needs of those who watch and listen day and night. The conductor of the orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl grew up in a family that had little interest in music but he often tells people he found his early inspiration from the fine musicians on television. Last month, a 13-year-old boy abducted an eight-year-old girl. And when people asked him why, he said he learned about it on TV. Something different to try, he said. Life is cheap. What does it matter? Well, life isn't cheap. It's the greatest mystery of any millennium. And television needs to do all it can to broadcast that, to show and tell what the goodness in life is all about. But how do we make goodness attractive? By doing whatever we can to bring courage to those whose lives move near our own. By treating our neighbor at least as well as we treat ourselves and allowing that to inform everything we produce. May it be so, my friends. Amen, amin, ashe, and blessed be. Joy. What do we pray for? We pray that in the midst of this falling apart and coming together, that there is clarity that can focus our attention. <laughs> Discomfort is not the same thing as safety. 
For those of us who feel unsafe in this world we live in, we pray for safety. And for those of us who have more safety in this world, we pray for our discomfort. Discomfort, you say? Why on earth would we pray for that? Not cool. Hear us out. At our two-month pediatrician appointment, the doctor laid joy on her stomach to see if she could lift her head up. She couldn't. We weren't doing that thing lovingly called tummy time. You see, tummy time is uncomfortable. It's the process of strengthening the back and neck and shoulder muscles. It's the slow process of gathering yourself up to move through the world. And we weren't doing it because, I mean, Joy cried during it. She was uncomfortable. Why on earth would we do it? So the doctor said, do it five times a day. We scoffed, but relented. Slowly and surely, Joy began to push herself up <laughs> off the bottom of her flat table, ground laughing and crying and facing us and perching herself up on her forearms until finally she could do it. We rejoiced. We were done, right? At our fourth month pediatrician appointment, the pediatrician placed Joy on the table. She did it beautifully. Surely we were done. Great, the doctor said. Now do it two hours a day. <laughs> exactly. Two hours a day. This is a good reminder. So, spirit of life, we pray for our discomfort. We pray that we will build the muscles in our necks and backs and strengthen our spines so that we are able to gather ourselves up and move through this world with the people around us. We know, spirit of life, that discomfort is a good sign. Help us know that when we are uncomfortable, we are probably doing something important. Help us not to retreat into thinking we've learned it all and mastered it all. Spirit of life, if you hear me say, I've already done that workshop, I consent to you smacking me. Poke me and tell me that surely we completed the five times a day version. But the practice next is to be about it. We pray to strengthen our muscles of healing, accountability, and relationship. Spirit, we honor the dignity of our neighborhood by resisting anything that undermines the dignity of the ones we call neighbor. We will start small and continue till that way of being becomes all of who we are. May you strengthen and may it be so.
reading today is from Akaya Winwood, African American activist, leadership trainer, and all around cool person. She writes, A long time ago, I turned over a big rock and I saw creatures considered yucky scurrying from the light. They were slimy and many legged and moved in ways that surprised and revolted me. I was five. Since then, I've learned that the slimy things were slugs, the many-legged things were centipedes, and the yucky moving things were pill bugs. All were part of the natural world. And I've come to take delight in and appreciate their roles in the life cycle. I didn't linger by the rock when I was five because I didn't understand what I was seeing. I wish I had been willing to stay and gaze and learn The natural world is wondrous and has much to teach us. These days, collectively, we are turning over old, tired boulders of white supremacy and patriarchy. Unlike the rock of my childhood, we are upending social constructions which have nothing to do with the natural world. What we are discovering is disturbing and revolting, and we are right to be repulsed by what we see. That said, it's time we stop being shocked. There's nothing natural about the ugliness of systemic oppression. And while we might be surprised by what's happening, it's important that we honor and retain our repugnance. Otherwise, it's easy to be complicit in it. As an adult living in oppressive systems, I find it important that I don't linger while watching deliberately constructed hatefulness, which is designed to capture my attention and thereby keep me off balance and off purpose. I lose power every time I allow myself to forget what I'm here for and to become distracted by the latest ugliness. Let's pay attention to what we're paying attention to The current administration has become numbingly predictable. There is nothing fresh and nothing to learn from it. I've come to assume that if there is a path that leads to chaos, hatefulness, and disintegration, that's the path this administration unwaveringly will choose. I've not been wrong yet. Our old systems are in the process of disintegration and decay. They are literally falling apart in front of our eyes. Some of us will resist and stand guard, making sure that the rot and fallout are minimized. Some of us will provide hospice, ensuring that the systems die well and thoroughly. Some of us will tend to the victims and survivors. Some of us will design and create new paths to a common and integrated future. All are needed. And it's essential that each of us understands and embraces our particular part of it. It's also crucial that we support and hold up the efforts of those doing the work that is different from ours. No one task is more or less important than any other. It is all honorable and necessary. The cycle of birth, growth, decline, and death is a natural metaphor what's happening on the global political stage. We are witnessing the death rattle of patriarchy and its handmaiden white supremacy. I suggest that rather than poke out around in the gore and continually make ourselves sick from toxic exposure, we attend to our collective well-being, remembering to care for each other and for the earth and to make art and love as we resist, mourn, heal, and build. We need every single one of us, those who revolt, those who restore, those who dream, those who create the futures we're committed to. Let's refuse to be bamboozled or fascinated by the ongoing and seemingly relentless ugliness of oppression. Let's insist on remembering that we are all kin and that repairing the world is both our birthright and our responsibility. We can and will do this. I know, for I have seen the future, and it includes all of us, from my heart to yours. Oh, before I go, 
one last thing. I wanted to share my gratitude before heading out into our neighborhood for all of our guest preachers throughout our Won't You Be My Neighbor worship arc. It's been the wisdom of Reverend Anthony and Alex, and today, oh, I'm Janine, wait, Janine, and today, Reverend Carlton, who have challenged me and charged me to go out differently into our shared neighborhood. I'm going out to draw near to the many various peoples who share our world today, draw near in love. So if you have a chalice, I invite you to get it ready with me to extinguish to these words by the In Flesh Collective, entitled Love. Love cannot be bought or sold. It does not make a profit. Love does not hide from truth. Love dives deep. Love takes on flesh. Love is queer. Love is platonic. Love is erotic. Love is asexual. Love confronts evil. Love delights in pleasure. Love touches and weeps and flirts and feeds and creates. Love is risky. Love challenges systemic evil in all its forms. Love is simple, but not easy. Love is collective. Love rises up. Love apologizes. Love believes. Love corrects. Love holds accountable. Love pays reparations. Love heals. Love tells its story. Love embraces everyone every creature, every creation. Love knows us intimately. It holds us collectively. Love transcends every boundary that seeks to confine it. It will not tolerate violence in its name. It does no harm. It only sets free. And in that freedom may we go and fully and actively love as neighbors. in the winter. 
doing so good. Yeah, you're doing it. <gasps> Joy Lynn. <laughs> yeah, you're so strong. You're so strong. Good job.